I'm going to be in Acts chapter 7 most of the time tonight. If you want to turn there in your Bible, Acts chapter 7. While you're turning, I uh, want to just give a, a brief, uh, by way of introduction, a brief testimony uh, from my past. When I was a college student, actually a sophomore in college, God invaded my heart and my life with a definite call to follow his leadership to start a church. I can't explain to you how exhilarating and uh, how much peace I had when God confirmed that call in my life and I accepted it. I had no idea what all that entailed when I said yes to the Lord, but I did know this, that I could surely trust him no matter what. In Acts chapter 7, we have the experience of a man that God called and a man that God used in just a special and uh, significant way. And yet, he began really as a failure. His name was Moses. He made a tremendous choice, and uh, he was just filled with human credentials that few could match. In Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going to read these verses. Hebrews 11:24, we read that by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You remember how he was found by her in that little, uh, uh, it was called an ark, a, a little uh, basket of rush of uh, rushes and how that she discovered him when he cried and she adopted him as her own son, called him Moses, which means drawn out because she drew him out of the water and really out of death. When you think of it, he was supposed to die. It was Pharaoh's edict that all male Jewish babies were to be killed. Here is an example of God's intervention and God bringing life out of death. There was a death sentence on this little baby, and God brought life out of death in so many ways. But the next verse says that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because he esteemed, he valued the reproach of Messiah, greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt because his eyes were on the payback, that future reward that he knew would be his one day by faith. So Moses made a choice, and uh, he had tremendous credentials. I had you turn to Acts chapter 7. And I wanted you to drop down with me to verse 23. <clears throat> In actually verse 22, let's, let's begin there. Listen what Stephen in his sermon says about Moses. He said, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds or works. Now, I'm going to say that Moses was a failure, even though he had such an education. That's what we see in verse 22. You know, having a good education does not mean that you're automatically ready to fulfill the call of God. I am not anti-education at all. I believe that often God calls men and women to receive um, high education in order to uh, train them and uh, prepare them for them for whatever he would have them to do. 
So I'm not against education. I finished college. I finished graduate school. But I didn't know enough really to do the will of God. I thought I did. As I set out to start a local church, you know what I found out? I found out that instead of me building a local church, God was building me. And I made a positive decision. And this is what I think we should understand in Moses' life. To obey God and to let him begin the training. God can only work out, I think, his deep purposes through a life in which self is dealt with. A life in which self is removed from the throne of our heart and Jesus is seated in the, in, in the place of ourselves. Moses didn't really know himself. I didn't know myself. Moses didn't really know himself. He was filled with Egyptian wisdom. He was filled with uh, eloquence, power in word and in deed. But that was all, all that education and the ability that it afforded him was all insufficient to God accomplishing his purpose through Moses. So he went from education to preparation. You might say he entered God's school. And uh, Moses' choice was, as I read in Hebrews 11, was to renounce royalty and to join himself with, I guess we would say, poverty. Because he had everything that his heart could wish for as a prince in Egypt. But he chose rather to identify himself with a group of slaves, his people. So he, he rejected royalty and he joined poverty. And of course, was followed by extreme trial that God used in his life. He had to go into exile. He had to flee for his life. But God used all of that to really liberate him from all the Egypt that was in him. Simple steps with real huge and real unforeseen results that take place. I want you to look at verse 23. Here we get his age when he entered uh, God's training. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Look at verse 24. And seeing one of them suffer wrong. Seeing one of them suffer wrong. And with a sense of being God's deliverer. Look at verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. So he sees one of his Hebrew brethren getting beat up, suffering wrong, and with a sense of God, God choosing him to be Israel's deliverer, his heart is stirred and he does what comes natural and he takes matters into his own hands. Whenever we do that, we've stepped outside of God's way. That was not God's way. God's plan was for this to end up in him going through a period of preparation where he would surrender himself to God completely. And this is what the Lord wants to do in every single one of our lives. Regardless of our education level, God wants to use us for his own special purposes, but there is a preparation process that we have to go through in order for God to use us effectively. And for that preparation process to really begin, it has to uh, start with you surrendering yourself completely to the Lord. Have you ever done that? 
surrendering yourself completely to the Lord and uh, as a result, seeking to know him. You know, I had a young man recently come to me and say, I, I sense that maybe God wants me in full-time ministry. I'm not sure. What should I do? And I said, forget about seeking to know whether he wants you in full-time ministry. Surrender yourself totally to the Lord and seek him. Because if you do that, you'll never miss his call for your life. He'll show you very clearly. If you surrender, if you seek to know him, he'll always reveal his will to you eventually when it's the right time. And he'll reveal his way to you so that you can be used by him the way he purposed to use you. Well, God had to teach Moses in this preparation process by first by allowing him to fail. So this preparation from a human standpoint leads to Moses' frustration. He must have been a frustrated man. When you think about how qualified he was at 40 years of age, we take 40 years of age as, man, we're in the prime of our lives. Of course, he lived a little longer than we do. He lived to be 120 years old. We live to be uh, octogenarians. Happy birthday, by the way. And, uh, but Moses made the assumption in that 25th verse, Moses made the assumption that the other Jewish people were ready for him to be their deliverer. And he found out, and I'm sure it frustrated him, they weren't. You know, this is a lesson that the Lord has taught me over and over again through the years, and that's this. God meets people where they are. God takes people at the level that they are on, and he seeks to bring them along in order to bring them to the place that he intends them to be. So he takes us where we're at in order to, to bring us along and put us in the place he intends us to be. And let me just tell you something. Because of that and because of human nature being what it is, if you are trying your dead level best to change someone by nagging them, by shaming them, by overpowering them, you're going to end up in failure. You're going to be frustrated. You need to learn to commit that person and what it is that you want to see changed in their life to prayer. You need to get on your knees and really depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to convince that individual. And as you do that, and as you believe God, you're going to see over a period, of, not right away, but over a period of time, the Lord miraculously transform that person's life. Don't ever blame others for your failure. Moses had to learn, first of all, in God's preparation, that he's a big failure. Don't blame others for your failure, but learn in those times of failure to seek God for his wisdom that will give you victory. So Moses started out, looked like he was, he had everything together, but he started out as a failure. But you know what? That's exactly where God wanted him. Because when he became a failure, that's when he was set on fire. He came in contact with fire. You know, fire in the Bible is often a symbol of God and his presence. And so that's exactly what happens. In verse 30, it says, when he was four, when 40 years had expired. All right. He was 40 when he had to leave Egypt. 40 more years have expired, which makes him what? 
He's 80 now. He's 80 years old. When he was four and 40 years expired, there appeared to him in the desert, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Moses spent 40 years before God encountered him, before he had that personal close encounter with God. 40 years, what was he doing? <laughs> well, if we would go back and read Exodus chapter 3, which we're, we're not going to do, we would find that he was spending 40 years in obscurity as a lowly shepherd. God was deprogramming him. <laughs> it was a deprogramming for 40 years of all he had to unlearn from his education in the world of Egypt. And God was stripping him of self-importance and stripping him of self-sufficiency and unlearning him the e Egypt's wisdom and Egypt's ways. You know, God is willing to take the time and exert the effort necessary in order to shape us into people that he can effectively use. Now, we don't live to be 120, and so probably we're not in obscurity for 40 years. It may be half that, might be 20 years. I've always called myself a late bloomer. Uh, I, I, I don't get it right away. It takes me a long time. I'm a little thick and slow. And so I feel that you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to begin to realize, you know, I think maybe God can use me now. It's timing that you see God exerting here in that 30th verse when he appears to Moses as the angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. You know what that bush was? It was just a thorn bush. It was a worthless desert thorn bush. It was good for nothing. We would call it tumbleweed in our American desert, but it was actually a bush that was rooted in the desert soil. God appeared in a flame of fire there. But the timing of this is significant. It's possible that God may have been waiting until all of Moses' hope of being Israel's deliverer had totally faded away. And, well, I must have mistake. I must have missed God's call. I must have misunderstood what God wanted me to do. But the time came when God's purpose for Moses finally materialized. The instrument, Moses was ready, and the people of Israel that he was going to deliver, were now ready. They were groaning. They were crying for deliverance. If you feel that your life is wasted or is wasting away, in a spiritual sense, lie down. Lie down right now and rest in God's will for you. God can't deliver people till they want to be delivered. You know, I've said often, I can't help people that don't want my help. God won't help people that don't look to him for help. And so there's this timing that is perfect. And it really comes down to this. Moses, have you had enough? Have you groaned enough, Moses? Or people, have you had enough? Have you groaned enough? Are you ready to be delivered? Are you ready to be God's deliverer? So the fire of God is so much connected with the right timing. But also in the training, God makes Moses... God meets Moses when he's just carrying out his ordinary daily shepherd duties. 
his ordinary daily routine of life. You know, the best training for serving God is just doing what God's given you to do right now. Just being faithful in whatever, how menial the task might be. You know, for uh, a, a mother working with her little ones, you know, washing clothes and, and changing diapers and, and uh, making meals. Or maybe it's a boring job that you have as a man, whatever. Doing that next thing that God has put before. In the ordinary routine of daily life, God grabbed Moses' attention. And he'll do that. In ordinary circumstances, God steps in and does extraordinary things. Just amazing. Can't uh, ever figure God out in this way. So Moses sees this bush on fire. And I don't think that that was the oddity. I think that by spontaneous combustion, that uh, these thorn bushes in the desert would uh, periodically burst into flames. What was different about this and what grabbed his attention is that this bush was on fire, not only without any human hand setting it aflame, but without any fuel to keep it burning because the tree, the bush wasn't burning. It was a picture of Moses himself, that bush. It was a picture, I think, of Moses himself, and it's a picture of you and me. It's what God can do when believers are indwelt, though they are little, lowly, insignificant bushes. When they are anointed by and indwelt by God himself, what can God do? And then it says that God called out to Moses. I'm going to go back to Exodus 3 for this because Stephen doesn't say this specifically in his sermon, but it says <clears throat> that Moses said to himself in, in Exodus 3.3, 3, I'm going to turn, I'm going to go and see why, why this bush isn't being burnt up. It's on fire. Why isn't it being consumed? And it says, verse 4, when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to check it out to see, that God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, when God speaks twice, that's for emphasis. He got his attention by the bush, and now he's speaking to him personally, one-on-one. -on -one. And Moses said, here I am. Now God calls Moses, and he calls him directly, and he calls him personally by name. You know, when God speaks to us in these personal encounters that we can have with him, when God speaks to us, we know it's him speaking. And we also know what he means. In verse 5, God says to him, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now think about that. Moses had been in that spot time and time again for 40 years. But all of a sudden, that place was holy ground. And it wasn't Jerusalem. And it wasn't uh, Canaan. It wasn't the Holy Land. It was the Sinai Desert. What's the difference? Why now? There's only one explanation. Whenever God's presence, wherever God's presence is, that's holy ground. When we have a meeting with God, it's almost too holy to talk about. It's holy ground. And so he learns about God's holiness. And then God reveals his name to him. Verse 6, he said, I am the God of thy father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, he didn't see the full glory of God on display. God was revealed in a, in a fire. 
and yet he hid his face for fear. And you remember, he says in that third chapter later on, he says, you know, <laughs> when I come to the children of Israel and I say, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they say, well, what's his name? What am I going to tell them? And, and God says, tell them, I am that I am. You know what that literally means? That literally means I'm I am. I am God in the first person. I am God in the present tense. That you deal with God directly and face to face. How are you dealing with God? Are you talking about God? Are you talking about God's work? Are you talking uh, about reading the Bible? Or are you talking with God? Are you talking, uh, are you working for God, with him, with God, or for him? Are you reading God's word and having him speak to your heart? See, only a close personal encounter with the Lord will make effective servants of God. And I don't think that we as believers should settle for anything less. I remember when I did actually begin uh, this fulfillment of God's will in my life to start a church when I we moved to Connecticut. We ended up with a third floor apartment in the eaves, really, it was originally the attic of this big old building. And uh, in the, the one bathroom in this apartment, <clears throat> there was a little door that was, I guess, a, a little place where you could store supplies. I mean, it was under the eaves of the roof. You couldn't stand up in there. It was only, you know, about that high. But I remember, you know, just just being overwhelmed, not knowing how to carry out what God had called me to do. And early in the morning before my wife and the kids got up, I would go in that bathroom and I'd open that little cubby hole and I'd crawl in there and I would just lay on my stomach because I couldn't even sit up. And I would just pour out my heart to the Lord and ask him to just use me, to give me wisdom. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. And to use me and give me wisdom and direction and enablement. I didn't know what I was doing. And God met with me. And God has continued to meet with me and with you as you seek him like that. God wants to do this in our lives. I titled this message, I forgot, A Close Encounter. I, I call it A Close Encounter. Moses had a close encounter, a personal one, with God at that, that burning bush. That's what you want. Go for it. Just in the ordinary routine of your daily life. Don't settle for anything less than a close personal encounter with the Lord.